I didn't get a chance to get a hold of the internet to get it changed up. <laughs> <laughs> Ray's not on the internet. I'd like to meet you guys. Okay. Hello, Clint. Hi. Eastward. <laughs> My name is the one that flies out in my Cheyenne language. Ibovid Nahista means I come from before the history books were written. Mahir of Ikisnamshim, Kingfisher, my grandfather, Nachista, in Cheyenne. And I can speak my language from prayer and conversation. And I wish every one of you a greetings, good evening. Every one of you, good evening. Pivashev, Pivashev, can you say that? Good evening. Good morning, you say, Pivawana. And when you're hungry, you say, Nahayan. <laughs> Today, I'm going to share some stories with you. Um, one of the stories, first stories I want to share with you, I don't know if uh, a lot of you are, uh, I know all of you have to be aware of uh, Leonard Peltier. Been locked up for over 41 years, <clears throat> and uh, they asked him to uh, uh, deliver a message of solidarity um, for the uh, water protectors in Standing Rock. So uh, on January 5th, <clears throat> he uh, wrote a letter. I believe he's in Florida now. I want to read this to you in case you guys haven't read it yet. It's on the internet. Greetings, sisters and brothers. I have been asked to write a solidarity statement to everyone about the camp of sacred stones on Standing Rock. Thank you for this great honor. I must admit, it is very difficult for me to even begin the statement as my eyes get so blurred from tears and my heart swells with pride as chills run up and down my neck and back. I'm proud of all of you, young people, and others there. I am grateful to have survived to see the birth of the united and undefeated Sioux Nation, Sioux Nation at Standing Rock and the resistance of the poisonous pipeline that threatens the life source of the Missouri and Mississippi rivers. It is an honor to have been alive to see this happen with you young people. You are nothing but awesome in my eyes. It has been a long, hard road these 40 years being caged in an inhumane system for a crime I did not commit. I could not have survived physically or mentally without your support. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart and the depths of my soul for encouraging me to endure and maintain a spiritual and legal resistance. We are now coming to the end of that road, soon arriving at a destination which will at least be in part be determined by you. <clears throat> Along the lines of what Martin Luther King said shortly before his death, I may not get there with you, but I only hope and pray that my life, and if necessary, my death, will lead my native peoples closer to the promised land. I refer, refer here not to the promised land of the Christian Bible, but the modest promises the trees our ancestors secured from enemies bent on their destruction in order to enable us to survive as distinct people 
to live in a dignified manner. Our elders knew the value of written words and laws to the white man, even as they knew the late the invaders would try to get around them. Our ancestors did not benefit from these treaties, but they shrewdly and persistently negotiated the best terms they could get to protect us from wars which could only end in our destruction, no matter how courageously and effectively we fought. No, the treaties were to benefit the Americans. This upstart nation needed the treaties to put a veneer of legitimacy on its conquest of the land, its rebellion against its own countrymen and king. It should be remembered that Standing Rock was the site of the 1974 conference of the international indigenous movement that spread throughout the Americas and beyond, the starting point for the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of the Indigenous Peoples. The rights of the indigenous peoples was resisted by the United States for three decades until its adoption by the United Nations in 2007. The U.S. was just one of four nations to vote against ratification, with President Obama acknowledging the declaration as an aspirational, aspirational document without binding force under international law. While some of the leaders of this movement are veterans of the 1970s resistance at Pine Ridge, they share the wisdom of our past elders in perceiving the moral and political symbolism of peaceful protest today as a necessary for us, for the people of Pine Ridge. Excuse me. In perceiving the moral and political symbolism of peaceful protest today is as necessary for us as it was necessary for the people of Pine Ridge in the 1970s. The 71-day occupation of Wounded Knee ended with an agreement to investigate human rights and treaty abuses. That inquiry and promise were never implemented nor honored by the United States. The Wounded Knee Agreement should be honored with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission established to thoroughly examine the U.S. government's role to the reign of terror on Pine Ridge in the 1970s. This project should be coordinated with the cooperation of the many international human rights organizations that have called for my immediate and unconditional release for more than four decades. I have to caution you young people to be careful for you are against a very evil group of people whose only concern is to fill their pockets with even more gold and wealth. They could not care less how many of you they have to kill or bury in a prison cell. They don't care if you are a young child or an old grandmother. You better believe they are and have been recruiting our own people to be snitches and traitors. They will look to the junks and the addicts and the child molesters, those who prey on our old and our children. They will look for the weak-minded individuals. You must remember to be very cautious about falsely accusing people based on more on personal opinion than on evidence. Be smart. I call on all my supporters and allies to join the struggle at Standing Rock in the spirit of peaceful spiritual resistance and to work together for, to, to protect Unsimaka, and Mother Earth. I also call upon supporters and all people who share this earth to join together in, in, to insist that the U.S. complies with and honors the provisions of the international law, international human rights treaties, and the long neglected treaties and trust agreements with the Sioux Nation. I particularly appeal to Jill Stein and the Green parties of the U.S and the world to join this struggle by calling upon my release and adopting the United Nations Declaration as a new legal framework for the relations with indigenous peoples. Finally, I urge my supporters to immediately and urgently call upon President Obama to grant my petition for clemency to permit me to live on my final years on the Turtle Mountain Reservation. 
Scholars, political grassroots leaders, humanitarians, Nobel Peace Laureates have demanded our release for more than four decades. My clemency position, petition asks President Obama to commute or end my prison term. Now, in order for our nation to make process progress, progressive healing its fractured relations with Native communities by facing and addresses, addressing the injustices of the past. Together we can build a better future for our children and our children's children. Again, my heartfelt thanks to all of you for working together to protect the water. Water is life. In the spirit of Crazy Horse, Leonard Peltier, January 5th, 2017. I have to excuse my throat, I got that black snake lung. Yeah. <laughs> I'm reading all that, whatever they sprayed on us out there. Um, I first uh, heard about uh, the movement when I was uh, about 12 years old. I was in uh, junior high. And uh, they brought it to our attention that there was a Cheyenne on the front page of Life magazine. So we all checked it out. We thought it was a dancer or somebody, or somebody that was prominent. And it was, uh, there was a group of individuals, about 40 of them, sitting in the auditorium space uh, on Alcatraz Island. And sitting in the front row, three rows, three people in, on the front row of the third person was Raymond Spain, a member of my tribe. Raymond was a, had a doctor's degree, but he never used the term doctor. He, was, uh, he graduated from Harvard University, uh, and he was a very, very smart person. He was a personal friend of uh, um, Bill Kunstler, uh, one of the, the lawyers for the Chicago Seven back in the 60s. And, um, it, it was really uh, impressive to, to see and hear someone from my tribe was there at Alcatraz to, to occupy that uh, <coughs> island along with all the other people that had taken over Alcatraz back in the 60s. 69, I believe, 70, around there. And uh, I had come to know my, my cousin brother, Colin, who was... Uh, pretty radical. His name was Colin Kingfisher. And uh, he, uh, he had gotten in trouble when he was a, when he was a youngster and he had to go away. But when he when he when it was time for him to come back he just kept going and he ended up out here in the Pacific Northwest, Seattle, Ashton, Oregon, all along the West Coast and started hanging around different people like Russell Means, Dennis Banks, Robert Free different people that he knew. Uh, and the next thing you know, there was a assembly at our school over at uh, Busby School in Montana, which was a Bureau of Indian Affairs boarding school uh, back in 1972. I was 15 years old, I was a sophomore in high school. And usually they used to, at least once a month, or twice a month, every two months, they would have these national school assemblies where all the whole school used to go to the auditorium and folk singers come over there and sing some songs for an hour, you know, if you had a class like that, you know, <laughs> kind of fun. And, uh, so we thought it was one of those, but, uh, you know, so, but they had all the students from kindergarten all the way to high school in there. And they had all these natives on stage and Floyd Westerman was up there singing, you know, singing with his uh, his cool guitar, you know. I'm not your BIA, I'm not your Indian anymore, you know. You know different songs like that, you know. And uh, so it was, it was a pretty impressive show that they were putting on and then right in the end there, that's when uh, uh, Dennis started talking, Dennis Banks. And then Russell Means got up and he was being real radical about telling us that we need to pull together and get on this march that we're going to Washington, D.C. And so we ended up 
some of us, you know, taking off from school. I had to drop off from school to just to go on that trip to Washington, D.C. It took almost two weeks. It was called the Trail of Broken Treaties. And there was over 3,000 natives that went on two different trails. One started here in Seattle and took the north route to Minneapolis through Montana, South Dakota. The other one started in Los Angeles and San Francisco and it converged in Arizona, went through Arizona, Oklahoma, and up to Minneapolis and they had a conference for two days. And at first they had a 10 point proposition paper that they were gonna to present to the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs in uh, DC. But as the steam started rolling, more and more people started getting involved in this trail. Soon there was way more people than they were expected in Minneapolis. There was over close to 3,000 there already. And so we kept on journeying on we stopped in Chicago at the Indian Center and they had a powwow. We spent the night there. We went out to Cleveland the next day. By then in, in Minneapolis, the, the proposition paper, because of the different many tribes that were involved, Northwest tribes with the fishing rights, and then the California uh, natives had their, their rights that they were, they were, they were being uh, forced against their treaty rights in Oklahoma. Their, uh, their oil oil rights were being traded upon. And then when we got to Minneapolis, they had all these different rights that were being, you know, being uh, misused by the government. And so the, the, the paper turned into a 20 point proposition paper that was going to be confronted to the, the delegates over there at the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And when we showed up there, it was in October of 1972, the last weekend. And it was a very crucial time that whoever thought of this trail had some good thought put into it. Because at the time, President Nixon was running for re-election then. And so when we went into those offices, and we found out that there was no places for us to stay. The scouts that went in front of us said they reported that five churches were willing to open their doors and let us stay in their basements. And when they went to check those basements out, there were rats bigger than cats in the basements running through each one of those basement churches. They were interconnected, so those rats were just running from church to church. They were, they were confessing their sins. <laughs> Anyway, so we, the people in our leadership decided that we're not going to stay there. We're not going to put our children and our elders at risk for health risks. So that afternoon when we got there, that's when they asked, they said, all the reporters, all non-natives, please leave the building now. That there was a press conference. There was all the major uh, NBC, CBS, ABC. I don't know if they had CNN back then. Uh, there was a bunch of them though. And all these different news people out there in front like that, and all the guys that were talking, they asked them to clear out, go out. There's two sides of the auditorium. There was two doors and the main door. The building was shaped like an E. And at the tip of the E on the second floor was the auditorium. And they asked all non-natives to leave. And then so, there was only two, na two non-natives that stayed in the building, and so Russell asked, Raymond, who's those two people there? He's talking to Raymond Spain. Who's those two non-natives that are sitting by you? And Raymond said, this is Bill Kunstner, uh, attorney for the Chicago 7, and his assistant, they're our attorneys now. I said, all right, you guys can stay again. <laughs> so then right after that, they said, well, we need 40 of you warriors. And they, they, they got away, they got off the mic, and they started talking and whispering. And they said, we need 40 warriors to run downstairs and take out the security unit down there. And in an instant, 
that both the doors were barricaded by these folding chairs that are all interconnected to each other. And they just piled them up on both doors and they ran downstairs and they overtook that security office downstairs. They got away with three of our warriors, but we got one of theirs. And he had his whole uniform on and he was running around in the building. And as they were taking our warriors away, you could see the U.S. Marshals taking them. But there was one warrior that was running around of their warrior in there, their security warrior. He had police hat on, had these pinstripe pants, uniform shirt, nice shiny shoes that don't, that don't, you know, it's always shiny all the time, you know. <laughs> and that CNO, he came running by, and he don't have his hat on. <laughs> the CNO, he's running by again, he don't have his shirt on, he just has his t-shirt and pants on. Next thing you know, he's running by again, he don't have his shoes on. Next thing you know, he's running by, he don't even have his pants on anymore. And every time somebody, every time he runs by, people are hitting him and it's like he's clawing at him. And women are scratching him and little kids are kicking him because there's children in there too. And then uh, people are tripping him, he's falling down and when he gets up, they push him back down and pretty soon the next thing you know, they finally push him out the door and they let him go. About five minutes later, you see this guy walking around. He's got a cool hat on, <laughs> got a eagle feather in there. Another guy got his shirt on. Look at my new shirt, boys. Another guy got his pants on, pinstripes. Another guy got his shoes on. He's all dancing around. So we counted cool on him that day, you know. But the thing about that building was that it was meant to keep people out when we were on the inside. There's moats on the outside of that building where you can't go straight into the into the window. You have to. It's just the natural government, you know, resistance type of building. And they got these big ten foot doors, maybe twelve foot, that were decorative. And they look real fancy, but they didn't know that we could lock them out from the inside. <laughs> and we had them locked out for five days out there. We stayed there, and they. Uh, they had a cafeteria downstairs, and for two days we, we, we feasted, and then all of a sudden we ran out of food on the third day. We started kind of rationing our food. We only got to eat twice a day. The word, they put the word out that we ran out of food. The next thing you know, had all these college students from Georgetown University, all these different surrounding universities around D.C., just start pulling up right in front of the Bureau of Indian Affairs building, just groceries, just unloading groceries, and we just, our security out in front would just go out there and get the groceries, bring them in, and everything. We didn't have all the water back then, but we probably would have got some, though. <laughs> but, you know, they was just giving us food and everything, and even some people would even bring pizzas and everything, already cooked and everything. They didn't know, you know, we'd eat it all anyway, you know. After a while, they just started the government started to starve us out. They wouldn't give us any more food, so we had to go down. They had opened up the uh, YMCA building for the elders and the children. So we set up a cook station and 10 of us each security guards we could get to go, go down there and eat. But we still only got to eat two meals a day. Finally, when Nixon won the election on that Tuesday, on that Wednesday morning, the Tuesday after the election was when it was, it was pretty well known that Nixon got reelected, and that's when they told everybody, we got to go now, you know, because otherwise we're all going to go to prison, you know. That was their threat, you know. If you don't leave now, you're going to all going to be facing federal time, so. But eventually, some of them did go to, go to prison, you know, for, you know, inciting riots and stuff. The leadership, some of the people had to go to court for that. And that happened in November 1972, which was four months prior to Wounded Knee. So that was just like a stepping stone to Wounded Knee. And there, that's when my brother came back through again. He's the one that took me to D.C. My uncle, who was my, my dad, wouldn't let me go. And I told him, I said, I'm going to be going with Colin. He said, if you go, he said, my, my uncle Raymond, he was a, ex-marine. Every time I got in trouble, I had to do 50 push-ups. You know? <laughs> and he said, if you go, you better not come back. He said, because I'm going to beat the heck out of you. 
And then pretty soon I told my cousin Paul, and he said, well, if I come, if I go, I can't come back because Raymond's going to beat the heck out of me. He said, don't worry, we'll pile him. When we get back, we'll jump him right away. <laughs> so I ended up going. I was only 15, and I uh, ended up missing my missing up my uh, high school. I had to stay an extra year, extra half a year at school. Messed up my plans to be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> so instead, I decided to go the other route, you know, and just keep on trying to believe in what I believe in, you know, and that's to try to carry on our ways that our ancestors taught us, you know, to try to uh, teach our children the way that we pray and the way that we take care of Mother Earth. I taught my boys, you know, that we need to pray every day for our lives pray for our families, pray for all our people, no matter what. Not only every day, but every moment that you're breathing, to pray and be thankful for what, what we have, thankful for what Creator has given us, the way that we pray, the way the people that we know, the homes that we live in, our families, our children, our children are gifts to us. We can only keep them until they're on their own. And then when they're on their own, we have to let them go. And let them be who they want to be. I was able to go to Standing Rock um, with the Piala tribe. Fortunately, I was, when I heard the call, of when I seen President Dave Archambault fighting the police, and I, my heart was, wanted to be there so bad. How am I going to get there? People were telling me, Ray, let's go over there. I, said, well, I don't have any money. I got, I got my place over here. I need somebody to watch my place. The next thing you know is that they called out for the canoes. The time when they called for the canoe families to come on out and to paddle that Missouri River and to be a part of what was going on over there at Standing Rock. And so, I paddled canoe with the Puyallup tribe in Sook Nation from Canada. And so when the Puyallups decided to take that call on, I was proud to be a member of, of the Puyallup canoe family, and I got to go along with them in September. And we pulled canoe from Bismarck almost to Fort Rice before we got hailed on real bad. And then the next day, we. We paddled from Fort Rice into Cannonball, and um, it was one of the most emotional feelings that I've had on a canoe. When we can pull it through the Cannonball River, all those people lined up, cheering both sides of the river, on Rosewood side and on the okay, just on Stockaway side, all just full just cheering us on. And um, we went through and we went underneath that bridge. We turned around, we turned all the canoes around and we all tied up together. And we pulled the canoes, all of them. There was like 11 ocean going canoes and a lot of um, Pacific Northwest River canoes. And we all pulled back and some other canoes, smaller canoes that were just with us. We all tied up and we put big banners up and we came back and we made it through two spans of that bridge all together and all united and we all came back and we all went and we asked permission to go to shore, you know, with the Arvo Looking Horse, sing a special song for us that we were able to go through and be uh, accepted as visitors on their land. But they didn't know that. He had to do that to every canoe. <laughs> so he really did get the very first canoe. They they really did a really fancy welcoming. They thought they were welcoming everybody. They really just extravagant. All their horns were being blown. <laughs> yeah, they didn't know they had to do that 11, 12 more times. <laughs> the next eight ones were kind of boring. <laughs> 
but we did it, you know, and it was good, and it was it was heartwarming. We sat out there for a long time, you know, not as long as Olympia, but you know, it was a while we sat out there. And they prayed for every one of the families that was out there, and the Lakota language sang a song for each one too, and it was good. And then uh, on the day that uh, we were getting ready to leave. Uh, I, I jumped uh, ponies over there, and I jumped in with uh, Micah Mason and uh, with the Quinaults and stuff, and uh, we decided to stay an extra day. And um, that's when uh, they made the first announcement that uh, that uh, the Army Corps, well, actually it was Obama, had came to an agreement with the Army Corps, Department of Justice, and uh, uh, the Department of Interior just to stop the work there that was being done the first time. But under the under the pages, um, Dapple was paying fifty thousand dollars a day to continue to work. They didn't tell anybody that though, you know. They was wondering why why was the workers why the why was work still going on and why did that road get blocked? You know, they, they didn't they blamed it on the water protectors that the road got blocked and the security say that there was no none of the people were out there because there was only certain times that people get permission to go out on that bridge, that backwater bridge. And mysteriously two trucks that the government had parked out there burned. And just in order for them to continue that blockade, they left them there. And then they started putting up they started putting up the S block where you had to make an S to get through there. And I took pictures, and I posted them up on Facebook, and then I got locked out of Facebook for about two and a half weeks after that, you know. So there's a lot of stuff that was going on when we were out there. I've been out there four different times now, and each time there's a lot of different things that the government was using against us. Our phones would go dead in an hour. We have to recharge them up again. They were using some kind of surge or something to, to deplete the power off our, our data on our phones. And then they and they were saying that we were being sprayed by something. Some of the there was planes always going around all the time, jamming our phones. And at one at one point they said there was even some spray nozzles on those and that people were getting sick and coughing and, and like and they said there's still residue on the dirt, and so when you walk around, you pick up that dust and breathe it in. And a lot of people have real bad sore throats and stuff from being out there, you know, from breathing in all the, they say that they spray chemicals on us and they can't really prove it. But they have people that have pictures of those planes with little nozzles on there, like, like the crop duster planes and stuff. And then they had the helicopters consistently just flying around us all the time. Just, just like as soon as it was daylight, you know. It, even sometimes I never even knew that they could fly those helicopters at night. I believe it's illegal to do that, but you could hear them helicopters flying around. And it causes a lot of anxiety and a lot of uh, what you call, I guess, PTSD, you know. A lot of... Uh, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. A lot of different people talking, saying things. And, and, and there was a lot of agitators within the camp, too. I believe that, you know, like the DAPO workers were sending infiltrators and causing arguments and stuff that this is not the right way to do it. This is, we should do it this way, causing arguments between different people. A lot of them were claiming that they were just there for the weekend, but they would stay longer try to cause trouble here and there. One of the things that I was most proud of was the people that were arrested, all the people that went and sacrificed, gave their service to the movement. Because, you know, it's gonna tie up their corpse. The preachers that all went over there, there was like 500 of them. And they even stood up and 14 of them went to jail. And four of them refused to be bonded out. They decided to stay until their trials are going on. And there's a lot of them that are that are 
decided to stay in. Some of them decided, well, you know, we're going to go in and stay, take up the space, so they want to quit arresting people. Yeah. <laughs> At the time when I, when I after after the canoes, I came back out to Standing Rock again, and then they were starting to take actions because they were getting tired of being pushed around, being attacked by dogs and getting pepper sprayed and everything, and then so. Back then, I, I just got back there, and I got to meet some incredible people that asked me to come along with them on some actions. They said, we're going to go, we're taking the actions into Morton County and Bismarck. We need elders to help us pray. You're going to be protected, because now we have arrestable allies. They had signed up people who were willing to go to jail. And they were called the arrestable allies. People who didn't have warrants, people who didn't, who were willing to go to jail for this. And so what they would do was when we did our marches, they would interlock their arms, 25 of them in front, 25 of them on the side, and about 30 of them behind us, to make sure that when we made movements, that all our elders and all the ones that did not want to be arrested were in the center. So they protected us, and all of a sudden the, 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 the police changed their tune because the police were targeting natives at first. They were trying to get all the natives arrested, and they didn't want to arrest non-natives because it was not a good thing to be arresting non-natives. But when the Allies wanted to be arrested, then that's when the result was, you know, they were arrested like 147 at one time, and my friend uh, Diane Hart, who had the uh, grandma's kitchen, was uh, right there at the North Camp when her her kitchen was taken down, and um, they took everything, her all her utensils, all her cooking supplies, and uh, she had a big tent. There it was set up probably about as big as this room probably, pretty high, and they just tore it all down, and they just mixed it in with all with the sweat lodges, all the all the different tents were there, all the clothing, all the sacred items, and they pushed them all into these dumpsters, and probably was like maybe two weeks later, they brought those dumpsters back, and they dumped them back on the grounds so right there at Okuchisasakwe. Just all crushed poles, sweat lodge, poles, rocks, everything, pipes, beadwork, clothing, and then even Diane's cooking tent and these tentos and everything all just smashed together and dumped out there on the ground for people to just sort through and, and finally they sort of they, they prayed for that stuff and they sorted it back out and they um when they got it back to its rightful owners paid over that stuff you know and i was fortunate to be able to go into morton county for some of the actions where a lot of things were going on a lot of things were happening which made the media finally become aware of what was going on they didn't like it when we took the fight back to their own hometown, back into Mandan and back into Bismarck, when we marched on the state capitol. And we went and marched around the federal building when, we, when they were holding some of the prisoners. And the next couple of days later, we went down to Morton County Jail in support of Red Fawn. We were marching around the courthouse square and instead of watching us, they were watching the Wells Fargo Bank over there. They had almost close to 120 cops around that Wells Fargo Bank around there protecting Wells Fargo, where your money is always protected. <laughs> but anyway, so after that, you know, was when uh, I had come back and I drove uh, Wendell Lee, 70 year old elder. He showed up over there at Standing Rock, drove up there by himself because he wanted to see his son. His son was out there, decided to stay and start working for the radio station. 
The window shows up, 73 years old. And that same day that he showed up, it was like 16 degrees out that day. It was no snow or anything, but it was cold. And he says, I want to go home now. He said, I, said, I need a ride to Seattle. So we jumped in, we, we, we held up, and we go back out. And then when I got back out here, I didn't feel right, you know. It was like the third time I felt like I was homesick. I needed to be back out there. I put a plea out on Facebook because I wanted to go back to Standing Rock. And somebody answered my plea and they, and they sponsored me and they got me a ticket to go back out to Standing Rock and I flew back out there. And I was lucky to be there at the time. I met some people in San Francisco on my way through. One of my brother's friends from many years ago that he met at Alcatraz, he's an author, his name is Arthur Jacobs. I stayed at his house. For some reason, the creator brought me to him. And I flew over to Minneapolis that next day. And here I was kind of, they said, Sorry, Mr. Kingfisher, but we have to move you to a different seat. And I said, oh, all right. We're going to move you to first class. He said, oh, good one. <laughs> so I got to fly first class all the way to Minneapolis. And when I and I noticed there was this guy down there who had this cool hat on and beadwork and stuff. He was sitting in a couple rows back and give up. Give me that nod, you know, that native nod. And, Hello, but you know, without a smile, you know. It's a, it's a stoic nod. You know. So he just kind of goes like that with his hat, you know. And the next thing you know, I seen him over there at over at the pavilion, and that was taboo from the the black eyed peas. I didn't know it was on the same flight. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was just another native, but he was cool. But, uh, anyway, I got to sing with him at the sacred fire at the drum. And so, when, he, when he said, I want to sing, I never sing in the drum with the, with the drum group. I want to sing with the drum, and we're all sitting there. And just then I got up to take a break, you know, go get some water and coffee. And I came back, and Taboo was sitting in my spot. <laughs> mm, go ahead, Taboo, sing my song, man. Anyway, so they sang, and then so the next thing you know, the announcer says, Okay, we got all these people that signed this drum. So a lot of people signed their drum and said, Taboo, we want you to sign that drum. And so when Taboo signed that drum, he raised his hand, everybody cheered. He said, okay, now give Ray his chair back. <laughs> <laughs> and let him sign that drum too. So then I, anyway, so I got to meet her at some pretty good times too. Uh, Bonnie Raitt was in concert with uh, Jackson Brown a couple nights later. But, you know, it's love. It's about love. That camp is a beautiful place. And you go there, and I know eventually all of you will be there one day or another. Because there needs to be a monument put up up there. We were talking about it when we were there at camp one day. And we were talking about how Standing Rock has changed the world through the actions that we're taking and through the, you know, like by, by being blacked out and the social media took over, you know, like the social network took over, more people knew about it than, than the news understood. And when it finally broke, and we finally, on that November 20th, when, when they were doing the water cannons and all the, the mace and all that, they were retaliating because we, what we took to them at Mandan and at Bismarck, they came back down and they retaliated in a big way and they wanted us to be pushed out of there. And so then that's when a lot of people wanted to go out there and they just wanted to do stuff and just annihilate DAPO workers, you know. And one of the things that I truly believe is that when the soldiers showed up, they had intentions of making a way up there to that pad site, and then to whoever was going to stop them, they were going to, you know, they were they, they were they were trained military personnel. You know, they have ways of stopping them, and they had it in their heart to 
go up there and just stop that pipeline. Our Creator brought this storm. He brought this real wicked blizzard. He blizzarded for two or three days when all the veterans were there. And it became like a disorganized chaos, you know, where they kind of knew what they were doing, but the, but the weather and the blizzard was just pushing everybody back. And it was like they were they would go out and do their do the actions on the bridge, but it was the blizzard was real bad. And the next thing you know, like people were stranded there. They were putting people up in the pavilion, putting people up in the, all the different camps were overrun. The community center was overrun. People were opening their houses and creator, you know put a damper on everything so that the military wouldn't go out there and show their strength and then annihilate, you know, the people that were, you know, possessed by what they were doing to our people, you know. And um, that's what I believe, because had it been good weather, they probably would have marched across and went up there and they would have had to fight those apple workers. There would have been blood in the snow. But fortunately, Creator took care of all of us. And now, even though they say that we put a stop to it, they're still working on it. They're still paying fifty thousand dollars a day fines to try to work, to try to make, to try to put that underneath the the, the, the river. But it's been stopped. You know, and they're still trying to find out the. Uh, the environmental impact study, which is going to take a year now, but then they, they, the Army Corps of Engineers pushed the, July, the January 1st date back to Jan, January 20th, which is actually the day of the inauguration. So they moved it back from the 1st to the 20th, so whatever Trump has to say about that is going to be put forth on that day. So a lot of people are getting ready to go back to Standing Rock for around the inauguration date. So it's, gonna happen. it's been a real pleasure going out there and being a part of it. You know, it's, uh, and being whatever they already had it there, tobacco, you know, cedar, sage, all that um, offerings that you could give. You could just go anytime and pray. Then it became evident that there was a lot of wood being used, so that's when they extinguished all seven of the fires, and they only went with one, which is which they started back up. And it's uh, it's a new sacred fire, new beginnings, and uh, it's run by women. So, you know, one of the teachings that, that my people believe in is the, in the Cheyenne Way is the women are are also, you know the leaders of our tribes, our beliefs that we that we use in our Sundance way is through the renewal of the of the buffalo and the women, the female. Because through women our nations flourish. The women are the ones that bring the babies into the world, our new warriors, our new mothers. And also, we pray with that buffalo, that sacred buffalo, female sacred buffalo calf, because she is a renewal of our of our world. Also, we we lived around buffalo. Buffalo was our way of life. We followed it where wherever they went, we followed them. And when the trains came. And the, the different trails that came they interrupted our migrations. And we had to fight for our way of life. The way that we pray, the way that we go to sweat lodges, the way that we go to sun dances, the way that we pray, the different ways we learned to pray because we were always feel fearful of our lives. Any minute, any second, we could be attacked. So we prayed all the time. We were thankful for everything that was given us by the Creator. All the food that were hunted, 
We prayed and we thanked the Creator for that food, that water that renourished our bodies. We're thankful for that. And we understood the importance of water because when we fasted and we took water away from our bodies, it made us see things in our minds that we never see when our bodies are fully nourished. So we knew the importance of water. When you take water away from an individual, they start to see things and they go into delusions, maybe even see visions, see people that they've never seen for, for a long time. And then they see things that they might see in the future or in the past. Deprivation of water through fasting. So we know how important water is in our lives. I want to share a couple songs with you guys right now. So uh, I want to brighten things up a little bit. <laughs> I don't want to depress you guys too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, good story, I hope you're not crying yet. <laughs> oh, this is a, a one of the songs that uh, that I used uh, when we were on our actions, and so we they asked us to sing some songs or pray a prayer. And there's this my one friend Olive, who's only about probably about five foot tall. She was always singing the Bota songs all the time. Just everywhere we walked, everywhere on our on our actions, and she knew all these songs. And then when I, whenever they asked, you know, for, to pray and stuff, and when we were on the front lines, I would I would sing this one song, which is a prayer song that uh, that I use in a, in, a, in prayer sweat lodge ceremonies. Um, and it talks about. Uh, Creator, um, we're praying to you. Creator, we're praying to you. Have pity on us. Creator, we're praying to you. Thank you. 
I want to thank you all for your kind attention. Um, I want to thank you all for giving me this time to share my stories with you. And um, I just saw I had a grandson last Thanksgiving. Sometimes I haven't seen him yet, and I'm looking forward to seeing him in March. He's going to come up and see me. My son and daughter in law are going to come up in March, I believe. We're going to pay for their tickets and buy them everything they want. <laughs> Someone started GoFundMe for that. <laughs> yeah, we just want to say that. I uh, want to thank you all for your continued support for all the water protectors over there at Sandy Rock, the three different camps the Rosebud Camp, Sacred Stone Camp, and uh, Kutita uh, Oyate Camp, the main camp. They're still threatening with flooding, which is uh, a very real threat. A lot of the structures are, will be underwater. If they do flood out the, the area, um, there's still going to be a lot of people out there. There's still going to be a lot of uh, help that's needed out there. One of the things that I'm working for right now is uh, trying to get Grandma Diane Hart's kitchen back and on the ground and running again. Um, she started a, a kitchen that was right there on the main camp. And when she moved it to the north, north camp that was uh, raided, uh, her, her camp went down, and then so they moved it back to the main camp, and she started getting all kinds of donations and uh, all kinds of different help from the California Consortium tribes of Northern California, and they had a lot of real, one of the nicest kitchens there. They had three structures, all kinds of donations every day, people just eating their left and right. And then uh, another pipeline is starting up there in Coos Bay, Jordan Cole, I believe, in the uh, California-Oregon border. And so the California uh, kitchen pulled out and uh, started to try to take some of their camp over there. And um, so Grandma Diane was uh, left with a lot of stuff that was donated to her, ended up going out to California or California Oregon border. So we're trying to organize uh, some, to try to get her uh, a refrigerator, propane powered refrigerator, and a, a huge generator so that they can power some of the, uh, the lighting and stuff that's needed to continue to feed the protectors. There's, there's different numbers that are that are always projected by different people, but there's at least there's over a thousand people there right now uh, within the three different camps. There's probably at least maybe 600 at the main camp, probably 300 at uh, Sacred Stone, and at least two, two, 200 people, Rosebud maybe, 200 or a little bit less, but regardless, there's still a close to a thousand people out there and they still need to be fed and they still need to be you know they they have they have uh, different costs and stuff and uh we really thank you for all the support i'm getting ready to go back out there soon again and we get diane hart's kitchen back on the ground and so thank you guys all for joining us here this evening love you all i hope Thanks for being able to have a safe place around the fire where we could share our stories. 
where you hear firsthand from people. So you didn't have to hear it on Facebook. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And that our revolution is kindness. Kindness to one another. Kindness to you guys tonight. Love, love, love. Thank you so much. wanted to mention that there are a lot of standing rocks both in Canada yeah. and the United States. It's not the only one. We need to be just as concerned with all of the other ones because uh, they're all the same struggle to protect water, protect life, protect our future generations. Um, I went to Leilu. How many people have heard of Leilu Island up in Simshian? Go ahead and look it up, uh, L-E-L-U Island in Simshian Territory. And uh, they're keeping out LNG, liquefied natural gas. They want to completely level their island. And they want to destroy all of their eel grass beds where the salmon uh, are hatched and born and are raised. And uh, this is a Malaysian company. And uh, so I went up there and, and uh, built a tarpy there for those guys too. Uh, me and a friend, a uh, new friend, went up there and uh, it was quite a journey. It took two days to get up there and through snow and ice, the Great White North, you know. And, uh, but it worked out great. We built a huge deck and I mean, the, the island is all rocks and ancient trees and there's nothing level. Um, we, had, we found one good spot, finally found it. Um, built the giant deck and, and put up a tarpy and that, that's just one other thing. So um, the, there's a, I just got a hold of uh, uh, two, uh, two Rivers Camp in Texas. That's, a, that's another one to be concerned about right there. Uh, it's the uh, Trans uh, Pecos. Trans Pecos, is a, they've got resistance and water protecting going on right there in Texas. Uh, I've got a friend who's going to Florida to water protect there here in a few days. So. There's a lot of these things going on, and we should all know about them. We should know about them just as much as we know about Standing Rock, because there's not just, this snake doesn't just have one head. It's got a whole bunch of heads, and we need to concern ourselves with all of them. So thank you for the yeah. That's good. Yeah. Right in the Sable Pipeline, I know that there's camps being set up there. Somewhere in the chaos of the 5th of December, that the fires that were there exploded and landed smack dab in our home, in millions and millions of homes, so that we could take the fight in our neighborhood through right action, through standing up.
Tinsel. It's the thing that brings the sparrows to the fountain zone. It's the thing that makes you run for the highlands zone. Mistaking clouds for mountains, so Thank you so 